The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Labor unions more often square off against government than tee up compliments for them. But perhaps a new day is dawning in Ontario? Tonight, the province's Labor Minister, Monty McNaughton, faces off against union leaders to assess this government's record for working people. Then, Nam Kiwanuka gets the 411 on pediatric COVID-19 vaccines now rolling out across Ontario. It's Thursday, November 25th, and that's ahead on the agenda. Tense relations between government and labor have been commonplace since, well, basically forever. But if a recent labor-related announcement by the province made shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with union officials can be taken as an indication of the state of things today, perhaps a new era could be unfolding? Let's find out. Introducing our guests, as is our custom, from furthest away to closest to our studio, beginning in Mexico City, Mexico, with Jerry Dias, National President of Unifor. In Vancouver, British Columbia, Fred Hahn, president of CUPE Ontario. In Oakville, Ontario, Victoria Mancinelli, director of public relations for LIUNA, the Laborers International Union of North America. And from his office near Queen's Park in Ontario's capital city, there's Monty McNaughton. He's the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development and the PC member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. And we are grateful to all four of you for coming on to our program tonight. And I guess we should just start by saying we got to do these in the interests of full disclosure. The people taking my picture right now, the people taking your picture right now, the people making sure the sound is good, the people making sure we're all in focus, they're all uniform people. So we get that on the record for everybody's edification. Minister, I want to start with you. In a recent speech, you said that conservative governments, quote, got it wrong for decades in their approach to the labor movement. Let's start there. What did you mean by that? Well, look, I, I've been quite clear uh, for the last couple of decades, uh, Conservatives haven't sat down uh, with Labour. I think back to my early days when Premier Ford asked me to take on as uh, the role as Minister of Labour. Uh, I met with hundreds of Labour leaders. I was the first Minister of Labour to march uh, in the Labour Day parade. I committed to opening a new dialogue with Labour, and we've done that. You know, there's an old expression, are you the Minister of Labour or the Minister for Labour? How would you answer that question? Well, I've picked a side, and that's the side of workers, so I'm a minister for labor. All right, let's find out from your friends here uh, how they would characterize the current relationship between their union and the current government of Ontario. Jerry, come on in here, and how would you describe it? Well, it's certainly better than it would have been under Tim Hudak, and certainly better than it was under Steve Harper and may have been under Andrew Scheer. But it's like the 1980s commercial, uh, Where's the Beef?, and so there's one thing about dialogue, but there's still some legislation that this government has imposed uh, that the labor movement and working class people despise. Uh, Bill 124, which really restricts 1% uh, wage increases to public sector workers. And that includes well, workers in the healthcare field. Uh, we have workers and uh, members in long, uh, not for profit long term care facilities. Um, that are stuck at 1%. We have all the orange helicopter pilots that are stuck with 1% wage increases. So that is a real black eye to the government. We also have Bill 195, which during the pandemic ripped up collective agreements and forced workers in the healthcare sector to, you know, waive all their vacations, made it more difficult with their, you know, shift changes were implemented. And then, of course, there's Bill 47, which tore up uh, the progressive uh, labor changes that the wind government had put in place, which meant the elimination of equal pay for work of equal value for part-time workers. It got through away the paid sick pay. Okay, so Jerry, I, I, I'm things. getting so the picture here, Jerry. We have Jerry. a long way to go. I get you. I'm getting the picture, and that's a, that's a long list. On the other hand, I did see you standing beside this guy at a news conference not that long ago, praising him for $15 minimum wage. So, how about that? Look, we are one balanced union. The bottom line, if somebody does something well, we will support what they do. If they do something wrong, we'll talk about it. At the press conference, I said that $15 was a good start. I mean, living wage in Toronto is 22 bucks an hour. Uh, living wage in London, Ontario is 16.55 an hour. Fred, how about you? How's the relationship between your union and the government right now? 
Well, the way I'd answer that question is by thinking about the way the relationship with working people. Uh, Jerry mentioned Bill 124. We're talking here about hundreds of thousands of frontline workers who got our communities through the pandemic, not just in healthcare, but in social services and in our schools and many other places who are uh, restricted from making sure that their wages will ever keep pace with inflation. We don't have permanent paid sick days in the law, something that people have been calling for throughout this pandemic for almost almost two years now. And working people actually rely on services. They rely on the things that we depend upon in our communities. The most recent financial update of the government in the fall took another half a billion dollars from our public school system. So this doesn't seem to me to be progress, to be developing a good relationship with working people. Uh, all right, Victoria Mancinelli, let's get your take from Leuna's point of view. Sure, you know, I agree that there is definitely room for reform in our healthcare sector. But when it comes to the skilled trades portfolio, we have not seen a level of commitment to advancing skilled trades in Ontario as we have with this government. And that's a testament to the leadership of Minister McNaughton, who has enacted transformative policies to strengthen opportunities for our members and Ontario's future workforce as well as highlight the skilled trades as a viable career path in Ontario. Now, I don't have to tell you, it's not frequent that you hear somebody related to a union in this province who comes forward and sings the praises of the Minister of Labour. That almost never happens. You just did it, Victoria. How come? I mean, let's give credit where credit is due. Layuna represents 100,000 members in the province, I'd say with 90% of our workforce in the skilled trades, in the construction industry. And we have a government that is listening, who is enacting reform to advance labour, advance the skilled trades, highlight the vast opportunities in this industry, something that Layuna has been doing, you know, since we were founded in 1903. So to have a labour minister who is willing to work with its labour partners is fantastic. Okay. Minister, I should get you to comment on the fact that Leuna seems quite happy. Uh, Jerry Dias, when you do things he likes, is quite happy. He's not totally happy with you. Mention a few other things he's not happy with. Fred seems quite unhappy with uh, most of the approach taken. What's your reaction to what you've just heard? Well, look, my approach is that uh, business, government, and labor have to work together where we can find common ground. Let's build upon that. All of us want bigger paychecks for workers across the province. We want more uh, workplace health and safety protections for all workers. And we want to create more opportunities uh, for workers so they can provide for themselves, but most importantly, uh, for their families. And Victoria is right. There's such great opportunities uh, in the skilled trades. Many of these jobs pay six figures with a defined pensions and benefits. I think that's something that unites all of us. Let me follow up on that. How difficult has it been to try to get Ontarians to consider the skilled trades when it seems that for many, many decades, uh, mom and dad want, want their kid to be a lawyer or a doctor or, God forbid, a journalist, something like that? Well, look, I, I've been quite clear. I mean, for decades in this province, under different governments of different political stripes, we've uh, told every young person that the only way to be successful in life is to go to university. That's simply not the case. I think in construction over the next number of years, we're going to need 100,000 workers uh, because one in three journey persons today is over the age of 55. Uh, if we want people to get jobs with benefits uh, and pensions, then we need to promote uh, the skilled trades, and it's going to take all of us uh, to resolve this issue working together. And one more follow-up to you, Minister. I I've always thought of you, and I, I think I'm right in saying this, I've always thought of you as being on the more conservative side of the progressive conservative party. I think I well remember a time when you were kind of championing right-to-work laws as they exist in the United States uh, here in Canada. Um, you haven't always been as progressive on these issues as you seem to be right now. Is that fair to say? Well, look, we're not going down that path, uh, not now and not ever. Um, I've, you know, been a believer that actions speak louder than words. And I was on the phone uh, the very first day when I became Minister of Labour to reach out uh, to Labour leaders. Again, we've got big challenges. When you think today in Ontario, 316,000 jobs are going unfilled. We need uh, Labour at the table working with industry and government to train our workers for these uh, jobs that are going unfilled. Okay, Minister McNaughton's thinking seems to have evolved on that issue, which is fine. When the facts change, you're allowed to change your mind. Uh, Jerry Dias, I want to put the same kind of question to you because you as well have been on a bit of a journey as it relates to this premier and this government. Uh, I do remember one time you said this guy's for the rich and he's got a track record of lying and bullying. And oh my goodness, we, we did find some footage, Jerry. We did find some footage 
Sheldon, you want to play that footage? You know, Doug. <laughs> you. Well, that was then. This is now. You've called the Premier a likable guy, and as I say, you stood beside him at the $15 an hour minimum wage news conference. How has your thinking evolved on this government and this Premier? Well, look, if they do something that I agree with, I say so. If they do something that I disagree with, they certainly hear it in living technicolor, as you just showed. Look, the bottom line is, is we're not in control of who gets elected. I, I agree with a thriving democracy, and that means that the parties that I want to win don't always get elected. But what it also means is that in order to benefit uh, working class people, I'm going to have to meet with the government and push the agenda. So I've been meeting with this government, I've been meeting with Monty, I've been meeting with the Premier, and I've been pushing the agenda. I would like to think the increase to 15, albeit low, was as a result of us pushing. I would like to think about some of the legislation on disconnecting and some of the other things, including skilled trades, is as a result of the labor market, uh, labor movement pushing. So, and look, am I madly in love with all of the things that this government is doing? Of course not. Uh, did I support them in the last election? The answer is no. Uh, but ultimately, if they are going to continue to do things and move in the proper direction, then I will give praise where it's due. I would like to think that I'm fairly balanced. But like I said, uh, more times than not, they've heard um, the fear come out of Unifor. And that'll continue until they fix some of the things that I mentioned earlier on. Well, let's actually uh, fact check what you just said right now with the minister. Uh, minister, can you tell us how influential, in fact, the unions represented on this program today and others have been in your thinking to change policy in Ontario? Really influential. I, I'm proud of the relationship that many of us have. I mean, uh, again, the first three months I met with over 100 labour leaders, uh, local local labour leaders plus provincial uh, labour leaders. Um, again, where we can find common ground, uh, let's work together and, and build upon that. Uh, and Jerry's right, we moved to $15 an hour after meeting with uh, labour leaders, and we're moving to about $15.50 an hour come October. So it is a beginning. There's lots of work we're going to continue to do uh, together. Fred, I am curious as to what went through your head when you no doubt watched that news conference of the government unveiling its move to $15 an hour for minimum wage, and you saw the head of Unifor there, the head of OPSU there, Smokey Thomas. Uh, I know there have been other news conferences where uh, Joe Mancinelli, the head of Leona, uh, was there as well. Uh, what goes through your mind when you see these labor leaders um, standing beside the Premier, the Finance Minister, Minister McNaughton, and others? Well, while that was taking place, I was actually at the Ontario Federation of Labor Convention, where over a thousand delegates from every affiliated union uh, actually debated an emergency resolution that said we saw right through what was happening here. Let's talk about this $15 an hour minimum wage. It's like somebody stole your car three years ago and they're giving it back to you, although it's got way more kilometers on it and a few dents and scratches. You know, more than $5,000 was ripped out of the pockets of low wage workers when this government, upon being elected three years ago, reversed uh, a plan changed to the minimum wage. They, you know, they dragged workers backwards, and we still aren't back to where we would have been in 2018 because well, of inflation eating away, of course, but also because there were other provisions like equal work for equal pay for temp workers, uh, you know, paid sick time permanently in the law. This doesn't even get us back to where working people were three years ago. Well, uh, but if memory serves, uh, I think you had to drag, drag the Liberals kicking and screaming to implement the $15 minimum wage increase back then. So are they in the well, same boat as the Conservatives now? What was interesting about that process is that it took two years, three years. There were uh, over 200 consultations. There were uh, a commission that traveled the province. Their recommendations were made public. They were debated publicly. Um, you know, these changes, by the way, uh, this law also hands billions of dollars back to employers from what's called a surplus at the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board. When we have a time when workers are being denied access to, for example, mental health uh, you know, uh, claims, 94% of them today are denied at the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board. That money could be used to help the mental stress 
that so many workers have been through during the pandemic. Instead, it's being handed back to employers. This makes no sense. All right, Victoria, let me get you back in here. Do you believe the policies, as enunciated by this minister and others, will substantially improve the lives of your members? I do, absolutely. Again, focusing on the skilled trades, you know, we've seen this dismantling of OCOT and streamlining apprenticeship programs, getting it back to a worker-focused approach. We've seen the implementation of the Skills Development Fund that is investing in unionized and non-unionized labor training program outreach, strengthening the representation of women in the construction industry, working with our Indigenous workforce to empower career-building opportunities. So there has been tremendous, tremendous growth and investment in opportunities for our members through this government. What's your union's position on the building of the potential new Highway 413? We support it. And if another party were to come into power after the next election, because, you know, we have these things every few years, and they decided to cancel it, how would your union react? We'd be very disappointed. You know, this is creating hundreds and hundreds of jobs and thousands of construction hours for our members and members across the skilled trades, long-term employment that is going to spur economic development for our province. So we would be extremely disappointed if a government were to come into power and cancel the 413. Is that to say that you will campaign on behalf of the progressive conservatives in next year's election? We will for various reasons. Um, you know, we will also be supporting some NDP candidates, I'm sure, but we will not be supporting Stephen Del Duca, and I can, I can say that transparently. Um, you know, in the last election, it was the Wynn government that orchestrated a direct attack on the members of LIUNA and interfered with jurisdictional disputes. You know Stephen Del Duca's background. He's out of the union movement, right? Doesn't matter? I do. Well, I mean, that was part of it. A little bit of playing politics here with his former employer and handing over La Una's earned jurisdiction to that former employer. Okay, back to the minister here. And, and Minister, uh, you, you've made several announcements. You've been very prolific of the last several months, making many announcements on many different things. I think one of the announcements that really captured a lot of uh, public imagination and discussion was the one where... And I forget the, it's like the disconnecting from work bill is basically what it is, where, you know, if emails come in at 8 o'clock at night, there shouldn't be an expectation from your employer that you have to get to that immediately, that it ought to be able to wait until the next day. People think that's what's in the bill. In fact, I think all you've got on offer here is that you've told companies they need to have a policy around this, not that they cannot expect a return email at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. Question, are you actually getting credit for something you're not really doing? Uh, well, well, I think so. I mean, look, the pandemic has changed the world of work uh, for everyone. And the lines between, you know, personal time and family time is blurred with uh, work time. So we want employers uh, with 25 or more employees to have um, a right to disconnect policy, to be very transparent with workers uh, when they should and must um, respond to emails and phone calls and when they should be uh, completely off the clock. So you're right, we introduced uh, the Working for Workers Act, which you know goes far beyond the right to disconnect policy. We're cracking down on uh, those bad actors that run temporary help agencies. Uh, we're ensuring that uh, truck drivers have uh, washroom access, uh, and we're recognizing uh, foreign credentials for newcomers that come to Ontario. Jerry Dias, what's your view of that bill? Well, you've you got to put some meat on the bones. I mean, ultimately, you're leaving it up to the employers uh, to come up with a policy that's kind of like Colonel Sanders taking care of the chickens. But in the last five years, Canada has gone from about 4% of the workforce working remotely to 32% today. So there has to be some changes. There's a lot of people who are, you know, working from home for free. Uh, what are we going to do as it relates to overtime? Um, I, I would argue that the working remotely and working from home um, is impacting women much more. Uh, women still carry their family responsibilities, I will argue, more than men. Uh, therefore, when you balance work and in, in, in family, it really starts to blur the lines. Uh, we used to talk about about uh, uh, working from home now, it's actually living from work. So we need to have some solid, solid legislation as it relates to the gig economy. But what are the rules? So it's a good debate, it's a good discussion, and we need to have it. But there has to be some legislation that actually starts to say, here's what it means. Um, uh, people are going to stop uh, responding to emails after 7 p.m. at night. Um, if they're responding after that, what's the compensation? Uh, what's the time off the job to compensate for that? What are 
there's a heck of a lot of questions. Like I said, there's a lot of European companies, uh, countries that are implementing it, Italy, France, so I can start to walk through it. Uh, but there's a lot of work to do in this subject, but it's necessary because of the changing economy. Minister, how do you take that criticism? Well, no, I, Jerry's right. I mean, look, this is a, a starting point. This is going to be the Employment Standards Act that companies have to have uh, a right to disconnect policy. It also puts workers in the driver's seat. When they go for a job interview, for example, they can ask what is the right to disconnect policy of the company. So Jerry's right. The world of work is changing. Government has to keep up and we're going to continue to bring forward uh, reforms that put workers in the driver's seat and, and respond to uh, the changing workplace. Uh, I, I think the automobile metaphors are uh, blooming today. Uh, Fred Hahn started it. Now Minister McNaughton continues it. Uh, Fred, tell me whether you believe that the current bill puts workers in the driver's seat, as the minister suggests it does. It does not. In the right to disconnect, it's a policy in the workplace. We already have the Employment Standards Act. There's no enforcement. There are no fine for employers. There's not even a recommendation on what this policy should look like. When it comes to using the washroom, something that I think, you know, that's just human decency. The bill actually says that employers don't have to do that. They can deny it if it's reasonable to them or if it's if, if it's not you know practical for them to allow access. That's a pretty big hole you can drive through. And the worst part of this legislation that isn't really getting talked about a lot is Schedule 6 that hands billions of dollars back to employers at a time when 24,000 healthcare workers have fallen sick due to COVID-19 in the last two years, and very few cases have been recognized by the board. When again, 94% of all cases for mental health and stress, something we all recognize has been the case for workers during this pandemic are denied at the board. And yet they're taking money, which they call a surplus and handing it back to employers. That's the sixth time in six years that premiums for employers are being cut. There's nothing here working for workers. Okay, let me follow up on that, Fred, because we did have OPSU President Smokey Thomas on this program uh, just a few weeks back, and his quote was, no matter what any party does, especially the Conservatives, it will never be enough for some members of the Labour movement. It will always be too late. They'll find something to criticize. Are you playing into his hands by taking the approach you have on this program tonight? Well, what I think is really important is to think about how this Im impacts working people. Will it actually help workers to disconnect from work. There's no teeth in this policy. It won't actually help. Will it actually provide bathroom access to delivery drivers? Not with that giant hole that's in the legislation. And will it hurt working people when money that could be used to help people who've been injured or fallen sick during a global health pandemic, the likes of which we've never seen, that that money could be used to help workers. Instead, it's going back to employers. I don't think that anyone when they know those details, would say it's, uh, you know, helping working people. Okay, let's find out from uh, Victoria how it works at Leona. Do you, um, well, let's do a real life example. Email comes in at nine o'clock at night. What do you do, Victoria? Well, I work in public relations, so disconnecting for me is a little bit more difficult. Um, as well as our members in the construction industry. But, you know, there is a lot more to this bill, including, you know, working with the federal government on immigration reform. The province is facing a labor shortage. It has been for years now, and the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified the need to start recruiting more workers, especially in areas like the skilled trades. So this one aspect of this bill on working on, you know, upskilling and attracting talent to Ontario is something that is going to greatly affect our industry. Would you uh, be disappointed, Victoria, if the NDP were to form the next government of Ontario? Listen, Layuna works with all levels of government across our part, all party lines. However, there is a lot that Layuna does not see eye to eye on with the NDP. And I think a lot of it stems from this strong focus on these traditional ideologies of what a conservative government is and is supposed to be. And that automatically puts up this great barrier not to welcome any positive reform that is impacting our workers. And another aspect with the NDP that you know we continuously bump heads on is investing in infrastructure projects, especially when it comes to the P3 model. It is something that we have tried to educate them on and try you know, to bring necessary reform 
and it's just not gaining any movement. You're talking about the public-private partnerships, which, which the NDP would prefer the government just ran the show on, as opposed to find some partner in the private sector to do. They say, ultimately, it's cheaper. You're not buying it? I'm not buying it. You know, Layuna has invested and built eight hospitals in the province of Ontario using this model, hospitals and healthcare institutions that most likely would not have been built without the P3 model, while creating job opportunities for our members and spurring economic activity and creating much-needed infrastructure that our communities rely on. Okay. Minister, I do want to get back to you to talk about uh, the, conserv the Progressive Conservative Party's relationship with Labour. And, uh, you know, for those of, of a certain age, they well remember the Mike Harris years in the province of Ontario where there were numerous strikes. There, were, uh, there was a lot of strife with Labour. And the PC party, as then defined, uh, thought of it as part of a badge of honour to get as tough on Labour as possible under the circumstances. Uh, Tim Hudak obviously never won an election, but he seemed to, as a minister in that government, take the same approach uh, when he was the leader of the PC party. Uh, Doug Ford, actually, was the same way in his first year, and he has uh, clearly changed his tune uh, as we get closer to an election. I don't know if those two things have anything in common. I guess my question for you is, how tough a sell was it to the labor movement when you approached them and basically said, I'm going to try to do things differently? Now look, it takes time to build relationships. I've spent uh, a lot of time, uh, you know, at coffee shops, uh, meeting with labor leaders in my office, hitting the road in every corner of the province uh, to sit down. Uh, it really is about personal diplomacy, uh, building trust, and finding that common ground. And I just believe, you know, passionately that uh, all of us want bigger paychecks for people that build stronger families. Um, we want uh, more health and safety protocols and, and more opportunities. We want more people getting their fair share of the economic pie. That's what I think unites all of us. When you told the Premier and presumably his Chief of Staff and other senior ministers, this was the new approach you wanted to take as the Minister for Labour, as you just described yourself, uh, what was their initial reaction? Full buy-in. I mean, I, I knew... Well, not from the beginning. Ford. It wasn't full buy-in from the beginning. Well, look, when I became Minister of Labour, um, Premier Ford and I, uh, you know, worked together. We wanted to find a common ground. But even going back further, I mean, I knew his brother Rob and, of course, the Premier himself. Uh, I mean, they are on the side of the little guy. They return phone calls. They show up at people's front doors to help them. Uh, it's in their DNA, and it's in our DNA as Conservatives to help uh, working families. I think you can remind me of this if my memory's off, but when you ran for leader of the Ontario PC party, who did Rob Ford support? He did support me uh, when I ran, and uh, he and I go back uh, a long ways and think the world of him. Okay, Jerry, let me get you back in here. Do you think your membership will seriously consider voting progressive conservative in the next Ontario election based on the positive things that you see this government having done for working people? Well, we've always had members that have voted for all three mainline parties. Um, and our union has been brutal uh, with successive conservative parties. Um, but I would be naive to think that our members, by and large, 100 percent, uh, voted the way they were asked to by, by their respective labor leaders. Look, Unifor has had a policy in the CAW before that. We don't have any blind loyalty to any party. That's because I will argue there's no party that has any blind loyalty to the labor movement. If I think about the NDP and BC, my good friend John Horgan, I'm still waiting for him to implement card check at 55%. If I think about 15 years of NDP rule in Manitoba, the best we ever got was card check at 65%. I can walk right through Alberta as well at card check at 60%. So, uh, look, I remember just a couple of elections ago where we had a hard time getting Andrew Horvath to talk about increasing minimum wage because she was courting small businesses. So I've got a whole list of, of problems that I've had with the Liberal governments. Same thing, of course, with Conservative governments. But ultimately, uh, we will talk about issues that are important to working people, what makes a difference in our lives, which makes a difference in our workplaces. And our members are going to vote how they see fit. For me to presuppose how they will vote, would be simplistic and naive at me at best. I understand that, but will you endorse any one of the parties in the lead up to the next election? It would be a shame, it would, excuse me, it would be a change if we did. 
Uh, we have never came out and said we're putting all of our support behind one party. Normally, we've been ABC, anything but conservative. Uh, at the end of the day, we will sit down with our board and we'll decide our politics and our response to the next provincial election at the appropriate time. So you're open to it, potentially, if the board goes along? Well, it would be a quantum leap, let me put it that way, for the board to say that we're going to be supporting the Conservative Party of Ontario, especially with 124 hanging out there. Our health care workers are mad. Our orange helicopter uh, members are mad. Um, Bill 195 infuriates a lot of people because of tearing up of the collective agreements. I can walk through a lot of laws that were passed, Bill 7, that have infuriated people. Are they doing things differently today than they were three years ago? Absolutely. But the proof is in the pudding. We watched Aaron O'Toole get elected as a blue Tory. The first thing Aaron O'Toole said when he was running was he was going to be Jerry Dice's worst nightmare and then he ran an election pretending to be a red Tory which nobody bought so the proof is in the pudding and time is is what is required talk is cheap actions mean a lot well Fred's pudding's always been orange Fred has always said I'm a proud new Democrat yeah. and uh, Fred do you plan to have your union endorse the new Democrats in the lead up to the next election uh, I uh, our, our members debate policy they know what they feel strongly and passionately about. And then we talk about which political party actually reflects that. And so the closest to what our members would like to see for themselves and their children and their communities and their future is what the NDP has had on offer. But I want to just go back for one quick second to this notion of helping the little guy. Because what we saw during the pandemic was that small businesses were left to wither while big box stores were allowed to open and yeah. have massive profits. What we saw that one of the first acts that the government took on when it was first elected was to reverse labor law, to actually uh, stop a minimum wage increase, to actually prevent equal pay for equal work for temporary workers. This isn't helping the little guy. It's important. And I think our members and other working people and their neighbors and their friends have to start to sift our way through the spin and what's being presented and look at what's really happening, what's really on offer. The truth of the matter is we're further behind than we were when this government was first elected. We are still in a pandemic where they're refusing to invest and do the things that are necessary to keep people safe. And they're presenting legislation saying it's actually working for workers that gives billions of dollars back to employers that could be helping people who are injured as a result of being at work. Okay, These forgive me, Fred. Facts. I've got to jump in because we're These down to our... I hear you. Th those are the facts, as you've enunciated them. We're down to our last 30 seconds. I want to give it to the minister because, in spite of what Fred says, I've actually heard from plenty of businesses who think your po your positions have been too labor friendly and and too anti business. And I wonder how you deal with that. Well, look. Um, as I said, I pick the side. It's the side of workers. Um, we have to build back a better and stronger province uh, for workers and their families. Uh, we've you know, been there for small businesses throughout the pandemic to the tune of billions of dollars. We now have to ensure that workers are getting a fair share of the economic pie. Uh, this is the beginning, the Workers for Workers Act and the changes that we're bringing forward, like recognizing foreign credentials, uh, banning non-compete clauses and the other things we've talked about. Uh, but there's going to be more to come. I want to thank Fred Hahn from CUPE Ontario, Jerry Dias from Unifor, Victoria Mancinelli from Layuna, And um, I don't I, I hope, anyway, the rest of you won't mind if I say I'm grateful to Monty McNaughton for coming on the program. Uh, along with stakeholders, it is a rare day in the province of Ontario when any minister shows up on a program with people who are going to criticize him. So, Minister McNaughton, thanks for coming on and good for you for doing so. Thank you. The vaccines for kids have landed. Tens of thousands of appointments are already lined up. With us for all those questions everyone may still have about it, in Dorchester, Ontario, Brenda Coleman, clinical scientist at Sinai Health, specializing in public health and vaccinology. And in Ontario's capital city, Dr. Tara Kieran, family physician at St. Michael's Hospital and Fidani Chair in Improvement and Innovation in the University of Toronto's Department of Family and Community Medicine. Hi to you both. 
Um, so I mentioned, I mentioned to you before we started taping that, you know, there's a lot of parents who have been waiting for this moment and very excited about this. But then we also have parents who are a little worried about getting their kids vaccinated. So we wanted to have this discussion to just clear up any questions that anyone has. Um, I'm Brenda. I wanted to start with you. Uh, heading into the holiday season across Canada, the infection rate of COVID-19 among 5 to 11-year-olds is higher than any other age group. Why is that? Mostly that's because they're not vaccinated yet, and most of the rest of us um, are at this point. The other thing is that they are close together with one another at school and while they're doing sports or dance, whatever they're involved in. And they don't always remember to socially distance and wear their masks and that sort of thing. So they're active, they're around each other, and it puts them at risk. And Dr. Kieran, school's been uh, in, in session for a few months now, um, and we know that the risk of facing serious COVID-19 symptoms and potentially ending up in hospital actually increases with age. Uh, given that, why is it that important that children get vaccinated? You know, that's a great question. I hear often from parents, you know, why do I really need to get my child vaccinated? Um, doesn't COVID just a mild illness for kids? And it's true that for many kids, COVID can be mild, but not all kids. Um, many kids uh, have experienced hospitalization or a, a, a more severe illness. Some have even passed away, unfortunately, and there've been 17 deaths due to COVID in Canada, um, and that's just 17 too many. Um, in addition, we know that many kids who have uh, COVID actually continue to have symptoms for weeks or months. Um, and so the rates of long COVID, we think, are anywhere from 4 to 25% in children. Uh, so, there, so, you know, I, when I think about my own kids, you know, I don't really want to roll the dice to take any chances. Um, you know, we've protected them about, against things like chicken pox, which is actually less deadly than COVID. Um, uh, for me, it was an easy choice to say, let me protect them also against COVID. Uh, you mentioned rolling the dice. I think there are parents who feel like they might be rolling the dice by getting their kids vaccinated. I remember when I had my two kids uh, in two different countries and I had surgery and before we left the operating room, they already received a shot and I think it was for vitamin K. Um, how important is it to communicate that information to parents right now, Dr. Kieran? So the vaccine is effective and it's safe. And we've got lots of data to show that. We've also got years of scientific experience. And one thing that I'd say to parents is it's really important to get your information from trusted sources. We know that there's a lot of misinformation out there on the internet. Um, so if you are looking for trusted sources, and, and later on I can re recommend some, please, please don't look at those. I think um, that, you know, what I'd like to, to emphasize around uh, the safety is, you know, it's been studied in a trial where it was given um, to 3,500 kids. And then in addition to that now, we've had almost 3 million kids in the U.S. receive the vaccine. And yes, there are side effects, but these side effects are generally mild and limited. So the most common side effects are pain at the injection site. Some children get fever, some children uh, so might get a headache or fatigue. Um, but these often are, 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 these are generally limiting to one to two days and can be treated with over-the-counter medications like Tylenol or ibuprofen. Um, there are some, I know, some some rare things that that kids were that parents worry about, and I'd be happy to talk more, Nam, about those. Um, Brenda, when we talk about side effects, we've been hearing about a condition called myocarditis for kids older than twelve who've gotten the vaccine. What is that? So that's inflammation around the heart, and it's generally we haven't had any uh, reports that it's caused any deaths, but it does cause um, issues with the child and they're often hospitalized just as, as uh, physicians watch to make sure that nothing untoward happens with them. However, this condition is much more common in adolescents in general when they're um, infected with the uh, virus. And it does happen after the vaccine. It happens in about nine to 50 per million the thing that I want parents to understand is that it's much more common if the child develops COVID. We can see it in somewhere between 4 and 40% of adolescents after they've had the uh, actual infection. So uh, it's another one of those things to say, we're, yes, you can get it after the vaccine, if you're, especially if you're a teenager, but you're more likely to get it if you're infected with the actual virus. Dr. Kieran? 
I just want to build on Brenna's comment there. Um, you know, it's important for parents to also realize. So, first of all, as Brenna said, this is a rare uh, side effect that was occurred. You know, and one in ten thousand at most. You know, in that that twelve to fifteen year old um, male age group. Um, but it's much less likely, as Brenda said, to occur in the kids' vaccines for three reasons. So first, the kids' vaccine is a third the dose of the adult vaccine, and we think that um, the risk of myocarditis is dose-related. Uh, so that means it's less risk because we have less of a dose. Secondly, um, as, as Brenda said, you know, physiologically, uh, it seems that teens and adults actually have higher risk of myocarditis in the general population, even pre-COVID. And so that the risk of myocarditis physiologically is just much less in five to 11 year olds. And then lastly, um, the government has recommended, so the National Advisory Committee has recommended that we have an eight week interval between the first and the second dose. And one of the reasons for that recommendation is to lower the potential risk of myocarditis. You know, um, an Angus Reid poll from last month showed that uh, about 54% of Ontario parents with a child who is between the ages of 5 to 11 would get them vaccinated right away. Uh, what concerns are you hearing from your patients uh, who are parents, Dr. Kieran? So I think a really common one is that pa pa uh, patients feel, parents feel that the vaccine hasn't been studied for long enough. Um, another common one that we hear is, you know, that it maybe it can, it's going to affect fertility. So I just want to address both of those right now. So for one, you're right, this is a new vaccine. But at the same time now, um, you know, we've had experience with mRNA vaccine, with mRNA technology since about 2013. And at this point in time, you know, there have been billions of people around the world that have received an mRNA vaccine. MRNA does not last, stay, the mRNA does not stay in your body and it does not um, give you long-term changes in hormone levels um, or fertility. It's true that some people experience temporary changes in their menses following the vaccine, but that's just, you know, many people when they experience stress get a change in their periods. And physiologically, many ch kids, you know, in that preteen time have um, periods that are a little bit wonky. Uh, so we don't, there's, there's nothing to, for us to be concerned about from a fertility perspective with the mRNA vaccines. And even though there are no long-term studies, all our experience with all sorts of vaccines, including mRNA vaccines, tell us that there's nothing that we need to be concerned about from a long-term perspective. If anything, what we need to be concerned about is actually the long-term effects of a potential COVID infection. We know that that risk of that is actually very high compared to any kind of minuscule theoretical risk, which you know is, I think, absent in, uh, for long term, uh, in a long term sense from from the vaccine. Brenda, you know, we uh, we've heard from a lot of parents who say that you know when they when it was their turn to get uh, a COVID vaccine, they did it. They were eager to do that, but now that they're thinking about getting their kids vaccinated, they're a little bit hesitant. How would you explain that? Uh, because we are parents and we do the best to protect our children, right? Um, the best thing we can do, one of the best things we can do is to make sure that we are vaccinated ourselves and that all of the adults around them are also vaccinated. And the other thing, it, we, we just are, we're just protective of our children and I don't blame everybody for doing that. But um, as was already discussed, this vaccine is safe. Getting the infection is not. So I, I think it's a, a, you know, it's, it's, it's about uh, protecting your children. So have them vaccinated. I'm really glad that we have this opportunity to talk about the side effects because um, I think there's this been uh, one of the, if you read the stuff that's online, it's a lot of people say, oh, well, we're not going to talk about, the doctors are not talking about the stuff that's really happening. But you've said, Brenda, that it's important that medical professionals don't sweep side effects under the rug. Why is it important that we talk about them openly? so that people can be ready for them. We want to have people aware that they will happen. You are probably going to have a sore arm. You may develop a fever, especially after the second vaccine. We can't pretend these things don't happen. People need to be aware that they may happen. And I think being informed is ultimate. And then, but we also need then to say what might happen if you aren't vaccinated. So as long as we're fair, people will believe us because it's true. We're talking about everything.
Um, but there is this idea that this hasn't been happening for a very long time and we don't know what's going to happen uh, a year or two years from now. How do you counter that? We've been using these vaccines in adults and it's the same vaccine, but at a lower dose. Um, and we we have the technology. We've been vaccinating people for over 100 years for a number of different diseases. We know what's going on. And although it might be not normal for people to say this, A, your government does not want to make you sick by giving you a vaccine. And whether or not we want to talk about it, the pharmaceutical companies are not going to give you something that is going to have you turn around and sue them because you've injured yourself or your child. Um, we're not out there to harm people. We're out there to save their lives. And Dr. Kira and Brenda mentioned the government, uh, the provincial um, opposition party leaders are, at, are calling on the Ontario government to add the COVID-19 vaccine to the existing list of mandatory school vaccinations. Is that a good idea? So adding vaccines to the school mandatory list for schools um, will increase uptake. And I think it's a good idea for those 12 to 17, because it's now been six months or so since those individuals have been eligible for the vaccine. They've had lots of time to do their, their research and um, see, see others uh, get the vaccine uh, and, and hopefully follow suite. <clears throat> Uh, I think the, uh, you know, for kids, it's it's a little early. We just got the vaccines, you know, for five to eleven year olds. Um, but you know, I think it's it would be great to contemplate having it as a mandatory vaccine, uh, for example, sometime in in the new school year in September. Um, what we know is 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 that'll help to counter any kind of complacency. So there are people who are actively opposed to vaccines, but that's actually a small minority. I think for many many parents, um, some, some are gung-ho, but then there's you know, a large group in the middle that um, you know, are, are maybe thinking about it. And I think that, that kind of policy change can push them uh, a little bit further. And I do wanna say that as well, if, if we make it mandatory, it's not that, that people don't have any choice. It just makes it a lot less, uh, it makes it a lot harder for, for um, people to not get vaccinated um, because you have to go through a, a number of hoops to say you know, why it is that you, for example, need an exemption. And Brenda, um, if the overwhelming majority of children in the province get vaccinated, will the province reach herd immunity? Oh, that's a tough one. I I'd rather expect not. Just because our immune, our level of immunity drops and if people don't get their boosters, we're going to run into trouble. We're going to have um, that people who are unvaccinated or less than ideally vaccinated coming into the country and traveling around the world and bringing in other variants. But it will certainly help a lot. It's going to reduce the number of infections in the province and in the country. It's also going to reduce the number of variants that we produce within the population of Canada and Ontario. We have to all though worry about those variants being produced elsewhere and being brought into the country. So I, I don't know that we're gonna reach herd immunity, but I think we'll get pretty darn close um, if people keep up with their booster shots as well. Uh, I just saw Dr. Kieran uh, raise her hand. You wanted in on this? Yeah, so I told I I I just wanted to um, chime in here to say you know when we talked before about the benefits of vaccination, I think we really uh, focused on the benefits to the child, and we talked about how it protects them from serious illness. But I wanted to jump in here to say you know it also means that if your child gets vaccinated, they're less likely, for example, to miss in-person school. Your family is less likely to be inconvenienced because uh, your child has gotten COVID, and you now all have to self-isolate for ten days or more, uh, depending on, on, on uh, how, how the infection occurred. And then it protects your family because, you know, uh, many people, many of us have members of our family that are older and whose immune systems aren't as strong as kids' immune systems. And so even though they're vaccinated, um, there is risk of breakthrough infection. And kids are often the people that are bringing that infection home. Um, and, and then finally, you know, getting kids back to, to normal activities and then getting all of us back to normal activities. So, so even if we don't reach the magical herd immunity, we're going to get, as, uh, as Brenda said, pretty darn close um, with continued vaccination and you know, continued uh, vigilance about other things as well. We know that COVID is not going away if all the countries haven't eradicated it. So how can we uh, be okay with giving a vaccine to five-year-olds when people around the world who are more vulnerable haven't received their first dose? 
So I'd say to parents out there that the government of Canada has already purchased a vaccine for your child, and it's going to be here in Canada. And you declining that vaccine is not going to unfortunately help people in other countries get the vaccine. And the same thing is true for booster shots. We've got those doses here, and we're not, we're, and the government is not sending them elsewhere. You know, as cases uh, are going up, um, especially with this age group, um, we're heading into the holiday season. It's also flu season. And I think there's a bit of confusion. I had my children vaccinated on Saturday, and then I found out that you're supposed to space them out uh, for two weeks so they can't get their flu shot and they can't get their vaccine for COVID for another two weeks. Can you clear that up for us, Dr. Kieran? Yeah, terrific question, Nam. So, uh, NASI has said that for adults, um, you know, co-administration of the COVID vaccine with another vaccine is just fine. For kids, they've said, out of an abundance of, of caution, we recommend a 14-day spacing between the COVID vaccine and any other vaccine, including the flu shot. Now, having said that, it is a recommendation, and I and my hope is that you know uh, that is not it is not going it is not a contraindication, and my hope is that there is flexibility. I can say this because you know uh, our own kids got the flu shot on Friday, and we booked them for their COVID vaccine on Friday and Saturday, respectively. We couldn't get two spots side by side, um, but you know we're we we're, we're we think it's that important that they get that vaccine as quickly as possible to protect themselves and to protect those of us or, uh, those people around. Them. Thanks for clearing that up. Um, uh, Brenda, when the health minister announced we would start vaccinating 5 to 11-year-olds, uh, she said that this represents a bright light at the end of the tunnel. Do you see the end of the COVID-19 pandemic tunnel? Not, I don't see it yet. <laughs> As I said, with the variants out there and the fact that we do have a number of people who are unvaccinated and the fact that there are millions and billions of people around the world who are not vaccinated. I do not see the end of the COVID tunnel. It's highly transmissible and um, we do have breakthrough infections. So I don't see the end yet, but my goodness, we're getting close to that herd immunity when we get the, if we get a large proportion of the um, five to 11 year olds vaccinated, I think we're getting darn close. Dr. Kieran, I'd like to ask you the same, uh, same question. I'm hopeful, um, and I do see, see see the end coming soon. I mean, I know that's hard to believe because we said it, I think, a year ago when the vaccines came out for adults. Um, but what, what's impressed me is that, you know, we're, we're almost at 90% of people in Ontario having at least their first dose. Um, I think it's 86% to fully vaccinated, and that's of those who are eligible, and now we're going to do 5 to 11s. We've also been really prudent, I think, in the way that we have um, reopened, and I think people are continuing to be careful around large gatherings and, and things they know that are risky. And so I think if we manage this winter well, we're going to be in good shape for the spring and the summer to come. It's true that there's still issues globally. Um, but I think uh, more and more we're going to be returning to uh, our, our pre-pandemic life I'm hopeful for uh, coming this summer. And Dr. Kieran, how would you be explaining this to your kids? Are they excited to get the vaccine? They've been following COVID along. And so, yes, they are excited. Um, you know, I'm lucky, though, my kids don't have a lot of fear or anxiety about needles. And I know that's something else that parents are struggling with. But just to say to parents that there are lots of techniques to prepare your kids um, if they do have fear and anxiety uh, about needles, um, talking to them about the importance of, of the vaccine for their health. I, I think all kids can agree that they, they didn't like online school and they don't want to go back to that. So this can help them to to, to have a normal life and you know the, you know if they if they're worried about pain you can buy one of these anesthetic patches or, or creams at the drugstore and talk to them about distraction techniques and breathing techniques or relaxation techniques during the appointment that can actually help them get through and and then finally plan a reward so we're definitely going to plan something special afterwards not sure what it'll be yet maybe a fun movie night some uh, uh treats uh who knows what else, but we're going to do something fun to celebrate. Uh, so, Brenda, when we got our uh, vaccines, it was a little bit like the Hunger Games. And I don't I think the situation has changed for children. If parents want to get their kids vaccinated, where can they find information on how to do that? So I bet I think the best thing to do is just to go online and go to the Ontario Ministry of Health website and they will then direct you to the public health unit in your area because things are being um, 
vaccines are being distributed differently in different um, health units. So there are mass clinics. You can get it from pharmacies. The schools at some point in the near future will be offering them. But is that the principals of each school, if there's going to be a clinic at the school, will be sending um, a notice out to parents. So go to the Ontario Ministry website. Um, there are a few others out there. There are um, there are there, there are spaces available, so go online, have a look, and um, get your child vaccinated right away so we can all enjoy a great Christmas. And Dr. Kieran, if parents still have questions or concerns, where can they find more information about the vaccines? So there's some terrific websites out there. Max the Vax is a new website that's been put together by Amanda Adams, a family doctor in um, Markham, uh, with sponsorship from the Canadian Medical Association. And they've got lots of answers to your questions, as well as terrific interviews and uh, video recordings, both for parents and children directly. Kids Health First is a terrific website put together by the Co provincial COVID-19 uh, vaccine table for children. Uh, and if you just go on their website, Kids Health First, and click on Parents, um, they've got tons of information about the COVID vaccine. Um, I myself have been part of a group that's uh, where we host a lot of our information that we've put together at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy website. Um, if your child has anxiety with uh, vaccines, then check out Immunize uh, Canada or immunize.ca and their CARD, C-A-R-D, um, resources. And then lastly, you know, if you feel like you want to speak more uh, about the vaccines, please book an appointment with your healthcare provider. And if you know you're having trouble doing that, um, please, you know, actually reach out to that Hospital for Sick Kids Vaccine Consult Service. Uh, it's a terrific resource where you can book an appointment one-on-one -on -one to talk to a healthcare professional who can answer your questions directly. Well, thank you to both of you for explaining, uh, getting into this topic with us. We really do appreciate your insights, and I hope that the parents who are watching, this gives them uh, a bit of room to breathe. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that is the agenda for this Thursday, November 25th, 2021. Elwi Yost is a much-loved name around here. And tomorrow, in advance of a new documentary about his life, we'll look back at his two and a half decades hosting Saturday Night at the Movies on TVO. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.